right, we are back. Hello and welcome to the Dragonfly Daily. I'm your host, Mike, the product manager at Drag at ORS, the product manager of Dragonfly. You can follow me at Dragonfly Wizard on Twitter, connect with me on LinkedIn, ResearchGate, and definitely check out the YouTube channel, ORSS.ca slash YTP2 is the playlist for this and all the other video content from the Dragonfly Daily. While you're there, browse around and find the other content that we are producing and disseminating on YouTube for you to learn how to use Dragonfly, learn image processing, and really take advantage of this software and these tools. Today's lesson for the Dragonfly Daily is Lesson 31, Python Developer and Debug Tools. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Also give us a like so we know that you're interested in Python customization content. If you're watching live, then you can stick around and ask questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, just as a reminder, the content that we are doing for customization and automation in Dragonfly fits in this five episode series that where we started in 28 with Macro Player followed by Macro Builder. Yesterday we looked at Python Console and Script Runner. Today we're going to talk about a little bit about the infrastructure and the organization of Dragonfly code, but we're also going to talk about some developer tools. So this is really going to be some developer framework and some debug tools. Then tomorrow we will do a specific menu item again example so you can see from beginning to end how to construct something useful as an extension or customization of Dragonfly. Now, a bit of housekeeping. So um, I'm hoping some more of you did your homework. If you did, then please go ahead. Now's a good time. Go ahead and type or paste into the Q&A block something you think would be a good demonstration of Macro Builder. Then we can take a special episode of the Dragonfly Daily and implement that. So whatever gets voted up. So go ahead and put that in and I'll remind people to upvote those for the ones that they like. And be, uh, be just uh, keep in mind, so few people are doing homework that there are lots of other people out there who are not going to be voting on their own solution since they didn't do one or their own um, request. So go ahead and if you made a request, put it in the Q&A block. Also on the topic of housekeeping next week, we will have our bone segmentation collaboration discussion and our graph and graph enhancements discussion. So be on the lookout for that announcement. It'll go to everyone who is registered for the live webinar. If you're watching this on YouTube and you have interest in bone segmentation or enhancements to graph usage in Dragonfly, then you won't get this announcement unless you are registered to go to orss.ca slash daily r with a capital r orss.ca slash daily r with capital r but it's also in the comments of every youtube video that's where you go to register for, to watch the live webinars also thanks again to dr matthew jindrong who will be with me today matthew you're already unmuted you can you can speak right now right right i can that's Matthew, everyone. Thank you, Matthew. Hello. We can all hear you. So um, Matthew is uh, is one of our lead developers, and he can fill in all the gaps. Um, today's lesson, Lesson 31, Python Developer and Debug Tools, we'll be using Dragonfly 4.1. And uh, uh, really, there's no, no reason to go back and watch Lesson 6, but you guys should have all watched that before. But uh, there's no reason for today's episode to... Uh, lesson six, customizing Dragonfly, but you may notice that my background has a different color or may have some different preferences because we have followed the customization outlined in lesson six. Now, before I dive into today's content, I am working with two strikes against me. Number one, I don't ever use any of the developer and debug tools because the guys don't give me much time. Well, that's not really the real excuse, but I don't actually spend much time developing or writing Python code. I guess I spend my time talking about Dragonfly with users and finding out what users need. So I don't use these tools, so they are not my strength. And the second strike against me is we ran out of coffee yesterday. So I am running on low. Um, hopefully I'll get some more coffee in the house and recharge before tomorrow's lesson. Now, Python developer and debug tools. Um, I think I'm going to not walk you through the outline of this slide. I think I'm going to go to Dragonfly and show you some things that maybe come back to this slide to keep me on track. The first thing I want to talk about is that Dragonfly code can run outside of Dragonfly. There was a question with lesson 28 on the macro builder. Can I execute a macro outside of Dragonfly? I gave the wrong answer to that question. I said, no, you can't. The answer is yes, you can. And there's even a page in the documentation showing you how to do it. So you can run a macro. If you have macros for doing image processing and cropping and creating new data, you can run all of those macros. If your macro specifically creates snapshots and movies and uh, content based on what you would see in the user interface, then that macro is not going to do you so much good. But if you want to do data processing macros, you can in fact run the macro outside of Dragonfly. I am going to go over to Dragonfly. I do want to draw your attention to the fact that if you go to help and you select Dragonfly developer documentation, that will open a web page directly to the documentation for the version of Dragonfly you are using. 
Now I'm not going to open it now because if I open a new web page from this link, it's going to fill my screen and it'll cover up the captions at the bottom of the screen. Instead, I'm going to tab over and if we look at this page, this is where you would land if you clicked that link I just showed you that was under the help menu Dragonfly developer documentation. What you see here, there's a lot to take in. So let's start with the getting started. Here are, you'll find the introduction to the developer documentation telling you how this page is organized. You'll also find video tutorials on how to get started, how to set up PyCharm. I'd like all of you to watch this video tonight. If you want to be able to do the exercises that we do tomorrow, you will want to follow this video, install PyCharm and set it up so that it can talk to Dragonfly, it can launch Dragonfly, you can run Dragonfly in debug mode, create breakpoints, do all of the rich developer tools that you're used to in an integrated development environment, you can use PyCharm as your IDE. So here's another video specifically on debugging with PyCharm. And we will dig in tomorrow to the content of this video, developing a generic menu item. You don't have to watch this tonight if you don't want to. This is basically what we'll walk through during the course of tomorrow's webinar live. Also uh, videos on how to create a user interface. So all of that there under video tutorials. Using the Python console embedded in Dragonfly, that was basically the sort of thing that we talked about in yesterday's content. Next you'll find, next you will find uh, using our introduction to Python. If you're already here listening to this webinar, you probably are comfortable with Python already and have no need to learn Python. Next, you'll find setup for development with PyCharm. So this is more a text-based description of what you saw in that video tutorial. This is particularly useful. This is code snippets. These are all different examples you can uh, paste and type directly into the Python console. So this can give you an idea of how to work with different ORS objects. Just some little examples that are well documented uh, doing things with NumPy arrays and data sets or what we sometimes call images or image channels, working with ROIs, working with annotations, how to apply spatial transforms to the objects in your workspace, working with Movie Maker, etc. So this is a useful place that is code snippets. Now that's all in the getting started. Down here you will find architecture of Dragonfly. I think I'll dive into this in just a minute. Now a moment ago I told you that you can run a macro from inside Dragonfly of course but also from outside of Dragonfly. There is a page in the documentation on macro block. If you go to this page and I think uh, Matthew would I just type macro block to pull up this page? It's probably where I would go. Um, oh, macro. No. Uh, you have to spell it correctly. Okay, good point. And, and here we are, we hit macro and we find this page. Now on this page, it describes a lot of what we saw when we looked at the macro player. We did open up the source code briefly and see that every block in the macro starts with a macro start. Uh, or a begin macro and, an, and ends with an end macro, shows you all the parameters for every macro step. So a lot of that is documented here in the documentation. If you wanted to batch a macro, we wrote this documentation, or I should say Matthew wrote this documentation. We wrote this before we even uh, created Macro Builder. What you see here is how you could instantiate a macro player instance in Dragonfly, or I should say in Python code without being in Dragonfly. Now, what I want to do is show you that if you are in Dragonfly, you always have the option of going to Tools, Start Command Prompt. When you execute this menu item, it will open up, at least on Windows, I think it's probably similar on Linux, it will open up a new console for you that has all of your environment variables, most importantly your Python path set correctly so that you can bind all of the Python libraries and use your import statements and they will uh, find the right libraries. So if I hit start command prompt, it uh, goes here. You can see that it's setting my ORS path, my ORS Python path, my Python home and Python path. Um, it's also setting other plugin variables. Now from here I can go to Python and then I can uh, from, well, what does it say right here? It says from ORS service class import macro player. So if I wanted to type that command, uh, I could do it right here. Uh, an important thing to note is that the Dragonfly installation installs Anaconda Python. I'm having trouble with my backspace. The Dragonfly installation installs Anaconda Python and it is sandboxed and isolated from your system Python. So when we install Dragonfly, it does not overwrite your existing uh, Python home or Python path. That's why you want to access Python from here rather than accessing your system Python. So this will access the Anaconda Python with all of the Dragonfly installed libraries. So you can execute this command and 
it goes and finds that class and then executes that class's import statements, which have many dependencies. So I think that's what's happening right now while I'm waiting for it. So this context has not loaded any of the Dragonfly dependencies, and so that's what's going on. Now, if you go back and look over here, you'll see that you could um, you could load a macro from your library. So if you have a, a library of macros and you wanted to load it, you could execute this command. Then if you wanted to execute the same macro over a series of ROIs, you could certainly instantiate a number of ROIs. Of course, these won't have value until you're importing them. But then you could uh, call this command, uh, define the input values for your macro, which would satisfy the input parameters for the different steps, and then you can execute the macro, and then you can stop the macro. So this, in effect, shows you you can execute all of those codes outside of Dragonfly. Now, the point here was to say that the Dragonfly source code can be used from outside Dragonfly. Of course, a lot of what we'd like you to be doing is to be developing extensions and customizing for inside Dragonfly. Now, the documentation that we were looking at, I got all the way to here, and then I said there are notes below. So we look at architecture of Dragonfly. There is infrastructure and there is extensions. If you go into infrastructure, you will see some useful ideas for how the Dragonfly code is put together and organized. We have, for example, plugin elements. When you go to create a new plugin, and we'll sort of define plugin a little later, but basically a plugin is a tool that lets you have the full richness and complexity of all of the extensions that we put in Dragonfly. So for example, for us, there is a window leveling plugin and there is a layout plugin. You can create your own plugins and those plugins might have interface methods. You will remember from lesson 27 on the macro build you can use or it's less than 28 but uh, less than 27 28 29 whatever they were on the macro player and macro builder you will remember the interface method is what you need to define as a programmer so that whatever you are doing in your program will be captured by the macro recorder. So remember, all of the methods you generate that you want to be logged and then replayable, all you have to do is follow the pattern for interface methods. You'll also see how your plugin can have associated menu items. Uh, actions we haven't talked so much about, um, but we have talked a few times about configurable actions. Anytime you want to bind a keystroke or a mouse behavior to uh, certain actions in Dragonfly, you can define configurable actions, and then they'll show up in your actions panel, just like all the actions that we ship. So we have actions for doing window leveling and for scrolling through data and for zooming and panning. Your plugins, too, can have their own actions as long as you define them and follow the documentation. We've talked briefly a few times about about states so dragonfly is always in a state it usually starts in the track state it tells you right here what state it's in it could be track pan so your program can access this and have certain behavior in some states and different behavior in other states and of course you can define your own states then there are interests we're not going to get into this today, but your plugin can declare interest in certain entities in the context. And that means that whenever those entities undergo changes, your plugin will be notified. So this is uh, tied into the callback behavior in Dragonfly. I'm not going to go into UI descriptors. You can find description about how mouse events are handled. You can find descriptions about callbacks. In yesterday, we saw that when I updated my data or I updated the properties of my data, I had to call set data dirty or I had to call set property dirty. You can look at the signature flags and see the infrastructure here so that when you make a change that the rest of the application needs to know about, you can update the state information on the ORS object model. Now, um, I just said ORS object model, which begs the question, what are we talking about? I'm going to skip over extensions for now. We're going to come down here to ORS model. Whenever you design an application, of course, you're going to decide what are the objects. This is object-oriented programming. What are the objects that represent the state information and the behavior information for getting the job done? So if I'm writing an image processing application, then I will have to have objects for images. I may also have objects for image filters. And you'll we'll have objects for meshes and for uh, graphs and for basically everything that you interact with in the software. So these are the individual classes that you will find in Dragonfly and the documentation for them. So this is our ORS model and that's what we mean when we say ORS model. Now I will draw your attention to this page. So this page is not easy to link to but I have included it in my notes for this slide presentation and we will put it in the YouTube page just so you can get to this page introduction to ORS model. So this is the fundamental library and it will show you a little bit about channels and a little bit about ROIs, some of the common methods. So adding labels to ROIs or adding voxels to label to 
ROIs, removing voxels, clearing, inverting, that sort of thing. Some documentation on multi-ROI. Then some documentation of structured grid, which I think I've only mentioned once or twice. A structured grid is the super class or the parent class for image channels and ROIs and multi-ROIs. A little documentation on mesh, annotation, shapes, then how you could convert between the different, uh, different objects. A little bit about how you can uh, understand and use the ORS model in the Python console. And these are screenshots from the PyCharm interface. So we'll see some of that tomorrow. Yesterday, I started talking about the global unique identifier. So that's all described in here as well. So lots of documentation to unpack uh, here. Now, uh, I will go back here. And that is ORS model. Now, I'm going to go over to my notes page. So. We talked a little bit about executing a macro from outside Dragonfly, and I mentioned states and actions and menu items, part of the infrastructure. Now, onto this part of the documentation, there are different, um, different. Uh, there's a hierarchy here where we're grouping different classes and Python codes, and it goes from those that are most atomic to those that are most interdependent. So, when you have ORS model, you can import for example, a channel or an ROI. You can import that class code and it doesn't have other dependencies. So it can exist independently and then you can start to program to those. So on this command, did I even hit enter? Maybe not. Um, oh, it didn't take any time at all. When I imported this command, it was a ORS service class and it was not just importing a channel. So when I executed this, it had to uh, go in this class, which had a lot of dependencies. It had to import and it had all of their import state dependencies. So it was doing a lot. When you are working at the top of this list, and the top of this list, I mean ORS model or ORS wrapper, there are very few interdependencies. So you can start writing your own programs that have nothing to do with Dragonfly if you want and use our data structures to be productive for writing your own image processing features. The next on the list is com wrapper. This is a bit of a holdover from a previous architecture, but here you'll find a, a, a bunch of enumerations. So for example, if we go in here, we can see that we have a bunch of constants defined. So when we're talking about uh, volume or surface or length, we saw this in yesterday's demo actually, when I wanted to use units and I wanted, I had a value stored in a data structure that was encoded in meters because that's the way we encode everything if you just interrogate the number. If you then wanted to convert to units, you would have to use one of these constants to determine what sort of units you wanted it to report in. And of course, we just asked the preferences for the preferred unit, so it just handed it to us. Um, you'll also find in here descriptions of data channels. So for example, data channels can be float or uh, unsigned byte or unsigned short. Likewise, meshes can have data associated with them. So a lot of times when you're passing this back and forth, you're not passing back the uh, simple integer, you're passing back the constant so the code is readable. And so that's the sort of thing that is defined here. Next, you'll find libraries. You'll find a lot of libraries that the Dragonfly software uses. So for example, under libraries, you'll find uh, a number of our image filter libraries. You'll find some of our Python libraries, just different uh, pieces of code that we use to make Dragonfly work. Working context is useful to consider, and we had a very, very short glimpse at this yesterday. Now's a good time to introduce that idea. I'm gonna come over to Dragonfly. As I have mentioned a few times before, Dragonfly is uh, always, everything you're doing in Dragonfly exists in a context. We almost always uh, force you to work in one context and it's modal. That means you can't be working in any other context at the same time. That's not a strict pattern you have to follow. If you want to create your own workspace and you want it to coexist with the main working context, you could do that. Now I keep saying context. If you remember the lessons from Image Processing Toolbox, um, we'll just show it here. If I go to Tools, Image Processing Toolbox, the software comes up in uh, this new window right here that allows me to set an image, set an image processing operation and do previews. I have limited access to plugins. I have no access to my menu items up here. The main context is back here. And this is the image processing context. So it is a constrained workspace for you. And we saw something very similar when we did slices registration. So that operates in its own context. Now I'm bringing all this up because you have something in Dragonfly called the context observer. 
This is not an interactive tool. It is just reporting to you on this dictionary that is defined that's available to anyone who's programming Dragonfly for any sort of use, whether you're writing a menu item or a plugin. You will have access to the Context Observer, which will give you some basically global state information. As I mentioned, it'll tell you what is selected in your workspace. It'll tell you what view is selected. It'll tell you where the mouse is positioned at any given time. It'll tell you uh, uh, it'll tell you what context we're working in, so we're in the main context, etc. So the Context Observer allows you to see information. You'll also find that if you need plugins to communicate with other plugins, there are different ways. If you needed a plugin to uh, disseminate information, this is maybe not the best pattern, but you can use your plugin to write information directly to this context dictionary so that all other plugins and all other extensions have access to those variables defined in the dictionary. Now. Um, so that was uh, libraries, and we mentioned the working context library, which we found at the bottom of libraries. ORS service class, these are Python services. So as I mentioned, when you import these things towards the bottom of the list, they will import other dependencies. The service classes are a set of packages um, often used for UI interaction. So if we make any custom widgets, or we are making plots for histograms that we want to reuse in lots of different plugins, you'll find those plots and canvases here in service class. Then there are ORS helpers, which are specific classes. If, for example, we have the ROI class, and we have the channel class, but sometimes we need helpers for helping you work with and manipulate those classes. So I'm not going to get into that today. If you have questions, maybe Matthew could take those questions in Q&A. But if I want to set the color of how an ROI is going to appear in different views in Dragonfly, if I want to manipulate objects that way, you'll find that in ORS helpers. Also, logging is maintained in ORS helpers. Now, I want to do two more things with the time that we have remaining. I want to mention some debug tools, and I want to talk about this uh, library, this is not the right word, this uh, list of possible extension types, we'll call it that. So um, first for debug tools, we just looked at the context observer. Now when you are writing Python code and developing in Dragonfly, you can also take advantage of something called the object model observer. The object model observer, when you open it, it will pull up two panels. So we talked about the ORS model, super fast, super brief. Everything that's in the ORS model is going to show up in this list, all of the instances. So for example, I have not loaded any image channels in my workspace, and so I'm not going to see any image channels I created in this list. And if I decide to create an image channel, so if I go to Tools, Create a Data Set, and I have a data set and I click OK, I now have an image channel over here. Now the Object Model Observer allows me to click this button, Refresh Model. And it's going to show me any new objects in my workspace that have been created since I last did a refresh. One of those is this. So it is the noise to it is of type channel. You'll also see I had to create an array of doubles. So obviously there were uh, dependencies and there are interlinkings and, uh, and subclasses, or I should say this is delegating to other, other objects and data structures. So a lot gets uh, created and done. Now, if I am trying to monitor the process of my plugin that I am writing and I know it's supposed to be creating channels, maybe it's creating too many channels, I could deselect everything up here and say just show me the channels in my uh, in my interface. Uh, is there a button to deselect all? I don't see oh. that. Okay. All right. So uh, if you want to do it this way, then you will have to uh, uh, deselect everything. But that's an option. It'll tell you how many are new since the last one, how many have been deleted. The ones that have been deleted will show up in red. If I hit refresh again, then okay, now there's nothing in green because I haven't created any new channels. But it is showing that this channel was existing. So it shows it pre-existed before I hit refresh. So I can't unpack everything that you need to understand about Object Model Observer in this, in this description, but this is one half of the Object Model Observer. The other half is this graph. I can show or hide the graph. The graph shows you how different objects interact and play together, particularly in the visualization environment. And so you'll get a tree structure and you'll see, ah, oh, here's my noise two channel. And it has something called a volume that's used for visualization. It also has a histogram object and something called a summary of a uh, histogram object. You can do some pretty crazy stuff. You can detach things and attach them other places uh, in the graph, but I certainly won't get into that today. So you can also, if you're looking for something, you can search by GUI ID or you can search by title. So I do have a, a title over there called Noise2. So I guess if I type Noise2, 
uh, and I tell it I'm searching by title, then I can find everything that has that title associated with it. This is a very powerful debug tool. Now, we also have a tool that is called the Instance Observer, and I think that's probably what I was going to get into next, super briefly. When I open up the Instance Observer, it'll appear over here on the uh, debug tab that just appeared. Now, over here is a, list of, is a list of every instance of every object I've created in the ORS object model. So if I select one, like if I select noise two, I can observe the selected instance. This in some ways is like the watch window you might use in your IDE. You can see uh, all of the parameters and state information for this uh, object. You can also define expressions you wish to be evaluated. Like, uh, and, uh, Matthew, could I type uh, uh, instance.getTitle and see what the title is? I guess that's kind of boring because it's already shown here, but I could type uh, instance.getTitle. Um, or uh, here's one that's not shown up. So if I right click on this and I go to dataset properties, there is a unit. Maybe I maybe I want to see the result of get units. So if I do that and I type get units, it says invalid expression. So that's not a valid uh, function on classes channel. I don't know, is there a, a unit? Well, that's not going to work. So, but you can type valid Python code here, and then it every time you hit refresh, this will be triggered. So you can see the state information of your different objects, and you can even evaluate expressions. These are powerful debug tools that can relate back to individual instances that have been created in your uh, Dragonfly experience. Now, just I know this is all overwhelming. Today's lesson is to introduce you to some of these things. We're really going to put it together. Um, in a useful way tomorrow when we go from beginning to end at creating a menu item. And again, you know, I apologize at the top of the hour. It's hard to fit these sorts of tools into 20 or 30 minute lessons, but uh, you asked for it and I foolishly said yes. So um, moving right along, that was the object model observer followed by the instance observer. And the last thing I'm just going to mention is the re-importer. And I'm not going to show you this today. We're going to use it tomorrow. If you're writing Python code and you launch Dragonfly and you want it to run your new Python code, you can play with it and, and see how it works. As soon as you want to change the code, you don't want to have to close Dragonfly and relaunch it. So the re-importer will re-import your updated code. It's super smart. It even allows your uh, debug environment to acknowledge the new lines and line numbers. So break points to continue to work. Um, we'll look at re-importer tomorrow. Now, the last topic for today is just looking at this list of available extensions. So there are a number of ways you can customize Dragonfly. Um, obviously, we have seen macros, which are a way of creating behavior in Dragonfly that you can share with others. Um, we haven't talked much, but about uh, lookup tables. Uh, lookup tables are a way you can extend Dragonfly. Obviously, there's no programming there. That's just changing the lookup of how different intensities get mapped to colors, but there are some documentation about uh, LUTs there. The next is generic menu items. So when you are in Dragonfly, you can have menu items appear in the list here, and the list can, uh, you can have something appear in the tools menu or the developer menu or the help menu, or if I am working for uh, Widgets Inc., I could have a special Widgets Inc. menu, so I can have my own customization tools show up there. Those are some top level menu items, but you can also have menu items appear here. And so you can create behavior by having menu items appear uh, in these different uh, organized list or appear at the bottom. So you can create new menu items and the menu items can be bound so that they only show up when you are clicking on an image channel or only when you're on an ROI or maybe only when you're clicking on two ROIs or 10 or more ROIs. You can define very easily the conditions on which your menu items show up. So that is the topic uh, of menu items. The next are generic actions, which I talked about. That's like how we set so that I can change the window leveling or I can uh, uh, maybe make this anything you, you fire with a, a, a fixed action. So if I wanted to uh, bind a key so that when I, you know, when I click this, it zooms to full screen, you could make a configurable action for that. Anytime you want to bind something to a keystroke or a mouse button without having to define a user interface with actually on-screen widgets, you can do that with actions. The next is image filters. So in our image processing toolbox, 
you have all the filters we've defined. If you want to define your own filters that take advantage of that same framework, that is, you can go to any slice and create a preview. You can put your filter in a stack with other sequential filters. You can take advantage of that just by following the framework and implementing your own image filter, and then it dovetails nicely and fits in with all of the filters shipped from the factory. Same thing for object analysis statistics. So we saw that when you're doing a multi-ROI analysis, this was a, a long time ago, I think in the third week, we saw that you can do volume and aspect ratio and mean intensity. You can make measurements and you want to make your, you may wish to make your own measurements and add them to the list. And so again, you follow our pattern, make your own measurements. And then when anybody who's running Dragonfly on that computer opens up objects analysis, they'll see all of the factory measurements, but then your custom measurements or custom statistics. Filter banks and region banks, those are particular to the segmentation trainer. Won't really get into that. Um, classifiers, I forgot what classifiers are. They may well. uh, also for segmentation trainer. Then property panels. So I haven't used this language much, but anytime you click on an object, you will see property panels. Um, so we saw, for example, that if I have an ROI, let's create an ROI. There is ROI one and there is ROI two. Let's take an ROI and do a little bit of painting. So painted and here's another ROI painted. If I select both ROIs, we see that there is code telling Dragonfly don't show me the standard property panels because I don't want to look at the statistics of, of both and it doesn't make sense to uh, have 2D settings of both superimposed on one panel. Instead, when I click both, show me this property panel which pulls up the Boolean operation so I can do a union or an intersection. So you can define your own property panels that add behavior to what appears in the property panel area when you select objects or uh, multi-selections of objects. Now, there are two more. There's slice analysis measurements. Slice analysis wasn't that long ago when we were looking at different ways of doing quantitative analysis in Dragonfly. So if you want to make your own measurements, like maybe you want to add porosity to the list or you want to add some other measurement, we already have moments of inertia. We already have uh, area, fra area fraction and we already have intensity, but you could add other measurements. The last on the list is plugins, and that's really the, uh, the the granddaddy of them all. So a plugin can be something like any one of these panels that has associated with it. It may include menu items, and it may include some property panels or some uh, configurable actions. So a plugin has lots of uh, lots of code, and uh, and most of these. Uh, you will impl implement interface methods. So whatever actions people are using. Um, when they're running your, your extension will be captured by the logger. So a lot to say about plugins. All right. Now, I think that's all I'm going to go through today. I don't think I'm going to give you the commercial, but just, well, yes, I will. So just as a quick reminder, uh, stay in contact with us. Email sales at theobjects.com if you want to make sure that you're covered under a maintenance and support plan so that you are eligible for actually getting our attention when you email or call for help. So uh, you, you may sometimes say, gosh, I, I tried emailing because I wanted a new license key and it took six or seven days. Well, we're, we're trying to be generous and help you with your license keys, but of course, all of the paid support members are those that are getting their help promptly. So if you want uh, that qualified support and you want it promptly, that's when you want a support plan. And also you see the other advantages of being able to stay up to date and being able to use Dragonfly Cloud if you're a non-commercial user and the ability to qualify for training and other details. So email sales at theobjects.com to find out more about getting current and getting your maintenance and support plan. So the one of the slides I pulled up introducing you to the ORS model is found here. I'm going to put this in the description. Well, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to ask my colleague Manuel to put it in the description for the YouTube video. For those watching the YouTube video, we'll find this link and give you some introduction a little bit to programming with ROIs or channels or meshes, etc. And uh, your homework, as always, uh, ignore that blue link. Your homework is um, we'll give you one more day to uh, dream up some macros you'd like to see. But that's actually what we're going to do right now. I'm going to go to the questions and answers. I'm going to see if you guys uh, put in some questions of uh, possible. So what, I'll tell you what has floated to the top. So these are suggestions for something to do in Macro Builder. Easy isolation of the cortical shell of bone to visualize trabecular microstructure. I, I don't know if that's the same as what we had yesterday. We had one yesterday where you wanted to, uh, oh no, that was someone who wanted to make a movie. So after segmenting cortical bone, make the cortical bone uh, transparent so that you can then see the, the trabecular bone and then make a movie out of that. Uh, here's one, packed and touching grain segmentation. So open 
image, volume, watershed, segmentation, filter by size, export quantitative info, size and shape orientation. We actually made a video on that. So it uh, if you if you Google, um, yeah, I understand now. Yeah, so you can Google the video on watershed and distance map and you'll see it, but you would like to see it implemented as a macro. Let me see if I will be permitted to do that. We may have some constraints. No, we don't. Uh, I think I know what to do. So um, yeah, so that's a, oh, lots of interest in that. Putting that in macro builder. Okay, very good. Next one, uh, repeating bone analyses for many specimens, including automated segmentation. Well, there's actually a collaboration underway where we're going to be doing that and that'll be published uh, 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 later this year. Um, so I probably won't take that one on, but we could, if it gets more votes, we could, we could do a, a, a smaller version of it. Um, all right, and uh, macro for importing multiple channel stacks with the same image while retaining pixel size. All right, um, easy isolation of cell parts for visualization. Okay, that's the uh, uh, for video. All right, I would love as a macro that would track a projection of the 2D view that I am exploring, walking through as a scaled colored rectangle in the 2D in the 3D view. Well, that's interesting. Hmm. All right, I am going to keep all of these in the questions and answers so we can mine this data later and then maybe we'll put them all up for a, a big vote um, on one maybe on monday we'll take all of the homeworks that we got submitted wednesday thursday and friday um, now uh, i'm at the bottom of my questions and answers and i see step-by-step uh, -step exercises to follow to learn how to build macros and custom routines would be very helpful for beginners to explore all those capabilities you showed us this week do you have something like that? So step-by-step -step exercises to follow to learn how to build macros. Um, well, custom routines, uh, we absolutely do not have. Um, so a step-by-step -step exercise to build custom routine, well, maybe I should say we do have, but it can't be generic. So there are videos that specifically show you step-by-step -step how to build a custom routine. So, but for you to get an education and see everything you need to know to build any custom routine, well, that's like a five-day course. That's why we're, uh, we're struggling to sort of introduce it in these Dragonfly dailies. Okay, um, but the videos are there and they, they're, if you go, if you visit that Dragonfly developer site and you go here, so let's, let's go, uh, I'll scroll all the way up to the top and I'll sort of click the little home. And um, on this page, what you can do is if you go to extensions, then you can choose any one of these. So I want to make a new property panel. Oh, wait, what did I do? Yeah, there? yeah, we still have our server that is uh, internet, service, internet service provider is working on that. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, are, are, all these, are all these out right now or? Yeah, probably, yeah. Oh, it's okay. I think it's coming back, but. Um, all right, well, try in yeah, a couple it, hours because these are yeah, usually it, here. Um, yeah, it has been a problem for the last uh, 15 minutes. Oh. Well, that's weird. Um, so what you'll normally find here, and I, I, I accessed this an hour and a half ago. That's very frustrating. What you'll find here is documentation about the extension. In, in the case of uh, menu items, there's a video. And you'll find source code, and you'll find step-by-step -step instructions and what you need to know to implement one of these. So there are those customizations. I'm telling you, there is a ton of documentation here on the developer documentation site. Um, we did mention a few days ago the interface methods uh, index when we were looking at all of the thing, different things that macros can do. You can find a module index, a general index. There's tons of documentation here. Okay, so I think you're overwhelmed and no one has specific questions about what we looked at today. Um, so maybe that's why we don't have, but what do we have? We have, do have a new question here. Um, I often use MATLAB for post-processing. An easy way of exporting Dragonfly objects such as ORIs or meshes would be great help. Is there already a solution? Well, MATLAB can import images and you can export ROIs as images. I think that was the topic of uh, Monday's and Tuesday's lessons. So you can certainly make your object and then you can put it into MATLAB. I think probably the, I would turn the question around and say, uh, what does MATLAB give you for post-processing that you can't do in Dragonfly other than that you have practice and experience using it? Uh, because if you could do it in MATLAB, you could probably do it in Dragonfly and then you would have them both in the same tool. You'd be able to process in Dragonfly and then you'd be able to do that post-processing in Dragonfly as well. Uh, so uh, for meshes, I don't know what data structures Dragon. I don't know what data structures, or I should say, I do not know what file formats MATLAB imports, but Dragonfly can export six or seven different file formats for meshes. So, all right, um, no specific questions.
questions on what we looked at today. I know it's overwhelming and uh, that's the, the brutal truth. What we should think about, and you guys can think about how this might work, maybe we should host a Python developer bootcamp where we uh, open up to 10 or 20 registrants and we let everyone come to Montreal or we meet at some city in the States or maybe we, we tour Europe and um, give you a beginning to end everything you need to know. Um, certainly you can't do that in, in 20 minute Dragonfly dailies. We could do it with on-site training at your facility if you wanted to pay for it, or maybe we could set something up where we do a boot camp and uh, bring people in. I know there'd be interest in that, uh, but uh, you know, kind of hard for us to decide where that should fit in the priorities of how we should allocate resources. So we do want you to use Dragonfly Python developer tools, help us figure out the best ways to empower you with that and we'll move forward. So tomorrow we will come back and we will be looking at, uh, at the making a menu item. So we'll go from beginning to end with a nice little interesting exercise and you'll see sort of how to put it all together. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for joining us. Let's see you tomorrow. Everyone, I uh, hope you're staying healthy and be good. We'll see you then.